God been good to anybody this morning? Has God been good to you in 2024? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is so very good. And we are just simply happy to see all of our guests that have joined us here today. Thank you for being a part of our first Sunday of 2024 service. Church family, let's take the next few moments. Show yourself friendly. Reach across the aisle and greet one another. several announcements for you, so if you could direct your attention to the screens for the announcements. I want to remind you that tonight is our communion service at 6 p.m., and then this Wednesday we will begin our Next Steps classes. This is four Wednesday nights, and if you would like to be part of Next Steps, it's going to be Wednesdays at 730 in room 103, and if you're new to our church, we invite you to be part of the Next Steps class. It covers basic biblical doctrine, and again, it's a four-week class that will begin this Wednesday. Also, Thursday night of this week, we'll begin grief share classes at 7 p.m. in room 120. So if you have recently lost a loved one and you're going through that difficult time of grieving and processing all those feelings and emotions, memories, we invite you to be a part of the grief share. It will last for 10 weeks on Thursday nights beginning this Thursday. Again, that is in room 120 at 7 o'clock. Wednesday, January 17th, is a special wedding shower for Savannah and Colton. We are excited about this young couple tying the knot, and uh, they are registered at Target and Amazon, so if you would like to bless them with a gift, you can go to those websites and find their registry there. And again, that's Wednesday, January the 17th. Let's all stand to our feet. This is the first Sunday of the month where we receive a, a special offering for our missions, global missions. As the ushers make their way forward at this time, they'll be placing the missions offering plates right here on the altar benches with a newsletter for one of the missionaries that this church supports. So we would invite you to uh, make your way at this time for a missions offering. And we'll also be receiving our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. Uh, if you would like to give, we have tithing envelopes there at the back of the pew, or you can do text to give. The number is listed on the screen, 832 something. I can't read it anymore. 957-9201. <laughs> and uh, web, uh, website, porterabc.org. Let's take a moment and pray over our tithes and offerings. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness and mercy today. We ask, Lord, that you would bless our missionaries that are serving across the globe this morning. We pray for a special blessing upon their lives. God, we pray that you would bless them with a great anointing, touch their families, the ministries that they are doing overseas. God, you would open up doors for them. Help them, Lord, in every way. Provide them with strength today. And Lord, we pray that you would bless the tithes and offerings that we receive in this storehouse. We pray that you would multiply it many times for your kingdom. In the lovely name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's worship with them as they sing. If you need prayer in your body, we invite you to come forward at this time. Can we lift our hands in this house one more time? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives.
our hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Because he lives. Thank you. 
listening to a song on the way to the church this morning. It's one of my favorites, and it uh, it says, uh, "There's just some things that only God can do." God-sized problems. There are, and that's true. There are some things that only God can do. But let's not forget, God can do. <laughs> he can walk into situations that nobody else can walk into, and he walks out with victory. That song talks about breathing on us. We know from Scripture. I love the, the Scripture he talks about in his vision of Ezekiel. He says, there was a great army, a reminder of what used to be, a reminder of what could have been, but now it's nothing. It's just a reminder of what could have been somewhere long ago. And he said, breathe. And when God breathed on him, he said, life came into them. Can I tell you, I don't know what it is you brought with you today. I don't know what shell of a life you are trying to put together that is just a reminder of what could have been or what might have been. Can I tell you, that is not the will of God for you to live your life just a living testimony of what could have been if you'd have done this right and what could have been if you'd... No, 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 no. Can I tell you when God gets a hold of someone's life, it doesn't matter what happened to you, what happened around you, what you went through, what did this to you, what left this scar, what hurt you. It doesn't matter. For when God begins to touch you, he makes all things new. There is nothing like my God. Amen. 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 I'm so thankful for the presence of God that I feel this morning. Thankful for what I... Man. There is liberty in his presence. You know, things happen in life. I've always had a little bit of an issue. Some, I don't know, maybe it's a big issue. I don't know. There are things that happen in life, and it just breaks you down, and you get sad, and you just find a cave to live out the rest of your days. I don't have that, that part. I get mad. I don't have that, that sad part. I have the mad part. When the enemy does this and he does that and you see the lies of the enemy and you see the snare of the enemy and you see the enemy doing this, I don't have that part where you go into the cave. and I'm, I'm not saying that part's not there somewhere. I just haven't encountered it yet where you just go and you cry. You say, What I have is a part that gets angry at the idea that somewhere in the world there's a devil that thinks he has any kind of say in what God has in store for his people. I get angry at the fact that there is a liar that lies to the hearts and the minds of men and tells them there's no way out from this. You'll never come back from this. He is the father of lies. The truth is not in him. If the devil's been telling you something, you ought to get a big smile on your face because he can't tell the truth standing on a stack of Bibles. If he told you your family's done, you ought to say, well, he can't tell the truth, so they ain't done. All he He's the father of lies. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. All he can do is lie and try to twist your mind. Ah, let me tell you, if, if, if the plan and everything that happened, 2023 was a, uh, well, that, that was around on the fight, wasn't it? And if the plan was for us to start holding vigils to remember what it used to be like in the good old days, you got the wrong memo. No, 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 no. I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to preach this today, but I'm going to preach it at one point. Abraham, Lot gets taken from him. His family gets taken from him. The enemy takes from him. And they look around. All Abraham has with him are servants. What are you going to do? All I got is a bunch of servants. Abraham, Abraham said, all I need to make a soldier is a person. They may have started as servants, 
But by the time we head to the enemy's camp, they're going to be soldiers. I still got enough to get a victory with. You may have came in. You may have left 2023 just a survivor. But you don't have to spend your life as a survivor. You may have went through last year as a victim. But you don't have to be a victim. We can come boldly to the throne of grace and say, Hey, if you thought I was going to sit here and take the toys that I've got left and live my life just trying to hold on to what's left, uh -uh. I'm coming back for everything that the enemy ever tried to take. I'm coming for every promise. I'm coming for everything God ever gave me in prayer. I am not about to sit back and live my life as a victim. You ever hung around a victim? Not a lot of laughing. Not a lot of joy. It's just you live in recovery mode. I'm not saying you don't go through those things. What's 24 going to be like? It's going to be the best year you ever seen. There are going to be more people pray through than we've ever seen. We're going to baptize more in 24 than we've ever baptized before. You, 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 you lost your seat in 23. You're going to lose this one in 24. It's going to go to a level like we've never had. And it starts, it starts with a decision. I don't want one person to miss tonight. If you're watching online, if you're listening, be here tonight. We, we are having our communion service tonight. And we are aligning ourselves with what God has for us. Tonight is a is alignment night. Because it doesn't matter what I want to do if it's not in line with what God wants to do. Prayer does not move God's desire over to where I want it to be. Prayer moves me into alignment with Him so that I can be on the receiving end of things that happen to someone that is living in alignment with God. And so tonight we have communion don't miss tonight also we are going in uh, all through January we have greater things coming at the end of the month we're going to go in and we'll get into more of that tonight we're going into a time of prayer and fasting through the entire month of January it needs to be for till Jesus comes but it is going to be a very focused time of prayer and of fasting for this month and for God just to begin to really deal with some things and break some things I'm believing for here for miracles healings I'm, I'm, I'm telling you it's available. He said, ask for it. Also, we'll get into it. Uh, we have to the end of January or maybe 1st of February for our missions offering. I'll get into the, more of that uh, this evening and in the weeks that are come. But we'll get that so we can get our offerings out to the missionaries, whatever God lays on your heart. We'll deal with that as well. Also, very quickly, wanted to make you aware of the passing of Sister Virginia Russell. I don't have the... Uh, all of the details I will uh, let you know as soon as I know something from the family but be in prayer for the Russell family as they go through this incredibly hard time but um, boy, I'm so thankful and there is no telling what's going to happen this year and I can't wait to see what God, anybody got some promises that God's given you maybe you put them in a drawer you know it's a keepsake of what could uh -uh, take it out Every day you remind yourself because, I mean, God is not a man that he should lie. And his arm is not slack concerning his promises. And if the enemy thought we're going to be in a corner and just wait, no, 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 no. We are coming out with everything we've got. I'm going to pray like I've never prayed before. I'm going to fast more than I've ever fasted. I'm going to win more than I've ever won before. I'm going to teach more Bible study. I'm going to grow in my walk with God more than ever. If... You thought I had a bad year last year. The devil is going to have an awful year this year. If anybody's ever felt like a victim, the devil's going to feel like a victim in this year. Now, he may, feel like a, he may feel like he's the king of the castle where you live, but he's going to be a victim in my house. Anybody else feeling that same way? Amen. I love you. God bless you. Why don't you make you wear that? Tonight, 5.30 in the prayer room, and then 6 o'clock right in here for our communion service. Do not miss that. Bring someone with you. Brother Ainsworth, turn it over to you. At this time, I'm going to sing a song. <clears throat> it's a song of uh, first Sunday. If you are new to our church, this is our first Sunday of the month where we do break off into classes. So if you can look at the screen, you'll know exactly where to go. For our junior high and high school students, you're going to be meeting in room 120. 
hyphen. This is our college and career group up to age 30. You're in room 103. Family life. This is single or married all the way up to age 45. You'll be in the fellowship hall on that side of the building. And 45 and up, you're right here in the sanctuary. So if you could make your way to your classes at this time, we invite you to be back tonight at 6 o'clock for our Sunday evening worship service. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good to be first Sunday class, right? Amen. Anybody thankful that the holiday madness is over? Yes, I am so thankful. <laughs> I enjoy it while it lasts, but um, I am one of those guys that December 25th at night, I'm done with Christmas. I'm ready to pack up everything and say goodbye to all of the decorations and uh, see you next year. But very thankful for the uh, time that we do get to spend with our family and all the wonderful activities. God is so good. This morning, uh, if you could put in my first slide, Sister Cassidy, I have a Bible study for you this morning, a lesson, and uh, the title is Resilience, and uh, it is becoming one of my absolute favorite words. I love it. According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it says, Resilience is an ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. Wow, that is such a significant word in our world today. The uh, U.S. Marines use this saying. They say, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Has anyone ever gone through a period of life, a trial, a challenge, and you thought, this is absolutely going to kill me, but look at you, here you are today. You're not dead. You are alive and well. Resilience gets stronger and stronger over time, but it does not happen passively. It does not happen passively. We work at resilience. We work at overcoming and recovering from the challenges that we face in life. When we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, such an incredible person, such an incredible person, the, what we know about him, his is a life of incredible resiliency. After you learn about Apostle's, uh, Apostle Paul's life, you wonder, you wonder how in the world was this guy not totally crippled mentally from depression, from PTSD, how in the world did he absolutely make it in life? You know, before his conversion to Christianity, he had quite a bit of a record. Uh, this is the man that we presumably know as the one who sent Christians to trial uh, and testified against them because they were believers of Jesus Christ. Uh, before his conversion, he watched families be ripped apart because of what they believed. Uh, he assisted in imprisoning, torturing, and even executing innocent people. That's a lot. And he did all of this in the name of God. He did all this as a uh, passion for maintaining uh, what we know as the Old Testament law today and maintaining that, that truth that we serve Jehovah and Jehovah only. And then uh, we look at his credibility. This guy that we're talking about, uh, he was a man of great credibility. If you could put up my next slide for me. 
Uh, he was a man, next one, we, he was a man who was a multilingual scholar, public speaker, master debater. Uh, he was a skilled tent maker. He was bold, loyal. He was a fearless leader, super intelligent, able to memorize large amounts of scripture. Um, he was a caring, articulate, and voracious writer, self-sufficient businessman who never asked for anything he did not earn, always striving for victory, never living as a victim, what we just heard from our pastor. And uh, this is all great. What an impressive resume. But it's his real-life experiences with trauma that we should really take note of this morning. And we find that he is someone who is worth listening to. The Apostle Paul's life after his experience on the road to Damascus was anything but envious. And uh, next slide, when we look at his life after his conversion to Christianity, it is filled with experiences that are so difficult for the average person to really comprehend. We read through this in scripture, but we really don't process and really think about what this man went through. Uh, he was deserted by all of his friends. He escaped from death threats. He was stoned, dragged out of town, left for dead, survived an assassination plot by 40 men. He was whipped with 39 lashes on five separate occasions, stripped naked and left in the cold, shipwrecked on three different occasions, lost in the open sea for a day and night, beaten publicly with rods on three separate occasions, repeatedly questioned, threatened, and chased out of towns, deprived of food, water, and sleep, falsely arrested many times, imprisoned without fair trials, chained to a prison wall for two years. Ultimately, Paul was condemned to death and beheaded. Think about that this morning. All of that happened in the life of one single man. One single man. We're not talking about someone who got pushed down as, as he was walking down the sidewalk because he was a Christian. We're not talking about a man who his wife suddenly left him because he became a Christian and then he just carried on with life. We're not talking about a man who just simply went through a couple of illnesses. But we are talking about a man who was humiliated, beaten down several times to the point of almost death. And yet he continued through life, living for God, preaching, teaching, and writing huge portions of Scripture. That is incredible. Absolutely incredible. When I look back on my own personal life and I look back on the experiences that I have and the times where I felt like I was just about to just mentally break down, and then I look at the Apostle Paul, I'm like, I hadn't been through anything. Nothing. I've never been dragged out to the parking lot and beat with lashes 39 times, much less five times. I've never had stones thrown at me, maybe words, but not stones. But I've never met someone who has been through even half of these things that Paul went through. If such a person were alive today, we would want to listen to them. If such a person was alive today and wrote a book on his life, you better believe that it would be a number one New York bestseller. Quite interestingly enough, the Bible is the best-selling book in the world year after year. But how often do we neglect to read that? You know, trauma is absolutely everywhere. And when we say trauma, trauma is a life-threatening incident or an overwhelming crisis. Trauma looks absolutely different for each and every individual. It may be directed at you, or you may be a witness to trauma. It can be a single intense event, or it can be a prolonged life event that is carried out for months or even years. Put up the next slide for me. About 70% of American adults will encounter trauma at some time in their lives. And of those 70%, about 20% of the 70%, or 46 million people, will develop either temporary post-traumatic stress, or what we know commonly as long-term post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Either one of these right here, 
is cause for crippling anxiety, nightmares, flashbacks, avoidance, and disability. I cannot even imagine the Apostle Paul, after even one of the events that we talked about, laying his head down at night and sleeping peacefully. It's hard for me to imagine. You know, we lose electricity for a week, and that's a traumatic experience for most of us. <laughs> we don't have a cold refrigerator, and that's trauma for most of us. We don't have AC, and the temperature in our house is 90 degrees, and we are ready to call it quits, throw in the towel, and we need a, we're on the phone calling the closest hotel that we can get. We got to get a room tonight. How they made it 100 years ago, I'm not sure. <laughs> But there are three different types of traumas that I want to define for you. And that is, number one, trauma from a random or and unavoidable events. And this is very simply understood as you witness a car accident, you may be a witness to a murder, assault, weather disaster, fire, or kidnapping. Uh, you may be diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. You are maybe a caretaker for a child or an adult that requires years and years of medical treatment. And then you have trauma because of risk-taking. And this is not necessarily in a negative sense. These could be simply first responders, people that work in uh, police officers, paramedics, doctors, firefighters. Uh, there's documentation out there that show that some doctors that work in the ER for years and years, they experience trauma. And they actually have to go through counseling. And they, they need help with what they see, what they witness. Or maybe you're a public servant, such as a soldier in combat. Uh, when we think of PTSD, we automatically assume um, warfare. But PTSD goes far beyond warfare. And then you have number three type, and that is trauma from self-inflicted actions. And this is probably the toughest one for us because there's very little compassion when we realize that someone is experiencing trauma because of their own decision making. Examples can include felons, drug addicts, drunk drivers, thieves, adulterers. Sometimes these individuals were victims of childhood trauma themselves, and now they are simply coping with life, and they're going through all these sinful cycles that are embedded from that life of growing up in a dysfunctional home or dysfunctional life, symptoms of PTSD. Or maybe it's just childhood, being a childhood victim. But being a childhood victim is an explanation, but it cannot be an excuse for making lifelong bad decisions. Amen? Whether you're an innocent victim or you cause your own downfall, I want you to know this morning that through Christianity, through the life of Jesus Christ, you deserve a chance to change, to grow, to develop, to recover, to live a renewed life. That is the beauty of God. That is the beauty of God's plan. Healing is never passive. You know, when we think of Bartimaeus, we think of that incredible miracle that Bartimaeus experienced. And uh, Jesus, he wanted, Bartimaeus wanted Jesus to cure his blindness. But it did not just happen. If you really read the story in Mark chapter 10, you find that Jesus asked him, he says, you know, Barnabas, because he was hollering, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And Jesus says, you know what, Barnabas, what do you want me to do for you? And we can read that Barnabas had to take action. He had to jump up. He had to move from his current place. He had to stand before Jesus. And he had to clearly communicate to Jesus I want to be healed. And that is a, that's a difficult reality because we assume that everyone wants to be healed. We assume that everyone wants to experience deliverance. They want to experience miracles. They want to experience life-changing moments. But the truth of the matter is, is that everyone really does not want to be healed. For whatever reason, they're stuck satisfied, or they don't see any hope whatsoever, and they stay and remain in that place of devastation, dysfunction, and trauma. What are the signs of trauma? Because we need to recognize what the signs of trauma in order for us to do our part. 
We cannot help but wonder about the Apostle Paul and trauma. What kind of man was he when he wasn't preaching or writing? You know, I hate to say, <laughs> this is going to sound so terrible, but every personality that is behind a microphone is not the exact same personality in real life. <laughs> I know that sounded absolutely terrible, but I'm just a real person, <laughs> and I call it as it is. But I have spoken to some people that are dynamic speakers behind a microphone. They seem like they have incredible personalities. But my goodness, you meet them one-on-one, -on -one and it's like talking to a wet noodle. You're like, are we, is this a different personality? What happened to the guy that was behind the microphone? <sighs> I need to stop. <clears throat> but you wonder about the Apostle Paul. And by the way, I'm not referring to our pastor. Do not go tell Brother McCoy that I said he has multiple personalities. <laughs> He's a wonderful man in the pulpit and outside the pulpit. So don't be spreading anything. But did Paul, did Paul go through all this pain and all this loss and torture and near-death experiences, rage, disappointment, and unfair treatment, and yet did he function with normalcy? Was he a normal person? normal. That's kind of a joke my wife and I have, like, well, they're just not normal. And I'm like, oh, yes, and we are so normal. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but did Paul struggle? Did Paul struggle with being cynical, jealous, angry, weak? Did he struggle with being a hateful individual at times? Did he struggle with full-blown PTSD symptoms? And if he did, you know what? We would probably make excuses for him. Because after you have been beaten, after you have been stoned, after you have been stripped naked, after, you, after you've been lost out in sea for days on end, and after you've experienced all this and been chained to a prison wall for two years, you know what? We'll, we'll give you a pass. We would expect Paul to have developed what is called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Next slide for me. Complex PTSD is a psychological disorder stemming from prolonged and extreme psychological and physical cruelty. And you would think that Paul would have this. You see this commonly in children who grow up in abusive homes, adults who have suffered from long-term spousal abuse, people who have been kidnapped or forced into slavery, Holocaust survivors, prisoners of war, victims of abusive cults. They would be people that would likely have that complex PTSD. The victims of complex PTSD may experience any of the following symptoms. Difficulty in developing social relationships, such as marriage and friendships. Trusting anyone with their thoughts, feelings, and well-being. Regulating their own emotions long after they are free from the abuse. Dissociation, meaning feeling disconnected from the world around them. Amnesia surrounding the traumatic events. Depersonalization, that is feeling separated from their own thoughts or body. Derealization, a sense that the world is distorted and unreal. A loss, a complete loss of their personal identity and personality. When we encounter people that are experiencing any of these symptoms, guess what? They are suffering from the effects of living in a sinful world and going through traumatic experiences. We need to understand these things as we grow closer to the day of the Lord's return. Because I believe things are not going to get better in this world. Things are progressively getting worse and worse and worse. But it's God's plan. But you and I as the church, we need to be equipped as a body of believers, to have understanding, to have compassion, to have love and concern for individuals that have literally been put through the meat grinder of life. They come from broken homes. They come from addictions. They come from battered marriages. They come from abuse. The list goes on and on. And you and I need to have an understanding of compassion and love when we interact with those individuals. And yet some people go through life and they're able somehow to let go of all this emotional baggage and mental anguish. What is their secret? 
And should we expect all individuals to recover exactly the same way? It is unfair for you to say, well, I've been through a similar experience. You should be able to get over it and move on just like I did. Is that fair to people? Is that fair to say, you know what, now that you have received this wonderful experience of water baptism and new birth experience, hey, it's all behind you. Move on. Pull up your pants. Let's get with it. No. How did Paul, how did Paul walk free? Because it blows my mind. It blows my mind that the Apostle Paul was able to walk free from even the first traumatic experience that he had and was able to walk in the Spirit, able to hear the voice of God, be able to write one letter after another letter after another letter that we call the New Testament epistles. He was able to preach. He was able to operate in the demonstration of the gifts of the Spirit. What an incredible life the man had. What was his secret? Was Paul truly immune to all the despair? He wrote a really enlightening two verses in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1. It says, if you could put that up there for me. He says, he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. Why do I have the wrong one? I'm sorry, Cassidy. Can you put in 2 Corinthians for me for that slide? Typed in the wrong reference there. <clears throat> Give me just a second. It's worth waiting for. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. There we go. The Apostle Paul says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. Listen to this. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. We thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. What transparency the Apostle Paul had. He was like, you know what? We endured things, I endured things, he says, that literally crushed me. It was devastating to me. And he says, I did not ever expect to make it. But I found a secret, and that is I stopped relying on myself, and I learned to rely on God. Amen. When we go through the traumatic experiences of life, I believe that, yes, it's devastating. Yes, it's horrible. Yes, it's unthinkable. And, yes, there are things that you won't even want to speak about. But you can take that as an opportunity to be crushed and to die, or you can take it as an opportunity to get on your knees and experience life-changing moments in the presence of God where you stop relying on yourself, relying on your own strength, and you are solely dependent on God. That place in prayer where you say, God, I don't have the strength to take one more step. I don't even have the strength to get up from this place in prayer. But if you will renew my mind, there's hope. There's hope. Paul never, ever gave up. He was a fantastic example of resiliency. But could we blame Paul, though, honestly? Could we blame Paul if he experienced any of the following found in people who have suffered horrific trauma? Flashbacks, nightmares, anxiety attacks, insomnia, eating disorders, chronic illness, inability to work, physical disabilities, alcoholism, addiction, isolation, loneliness, personality disorders, delusions, depression, suicide. Could we blame Paul if he experienced any of those symptoms? Could we blame Paul that if he had a bad day, that he simply shut the door and didn't want to speak to anybody? 
Could we blame Paul if there was just a couple of hours in the day where he experienced depression? Could we blame Paul that maybe as he was walking through the streets at times that an anxiety attack came over him and he began to hyperventilate and he had to tuck back into an alleyway somewhere and take a deep breath? After all, the man was human. It is okay this morning for each and every individual to say, yes, I'm a believer, yes, I'm filled with the Spirit, and yes, there are times that I still suffer. It doesn't make you of a less than individual. These are all common mental health challenges that I just read that we are faced all across the world today. And the Bible, think about it, the Bible is continuously the best-selling book in the world written by a man who suffered immense trauma. Instead of breaking down mentally, Paul's strength grew with every single trial that he faced. Put the next slide for me. So what was Paul's secret for maintaining his mental health? I love this. I love this right here. Paul's psychological and spiritual resilience gave him the armor for his resistance, which gave him hope for his recovery, where his renewal completely changed his life through his faith. There is a lot wrapped up in that right there. Paul's psychological and spiritual resilience, the ability to recover, gave him the armor. What is the armor? It's the whole armor of God. For his resistance, that is how we fight, which gave him hope for his recovery because each and every one of us are recovering every day. Every day we are recovering. Where his renewal, that is the operation of the Spirit, completely changed his life through his faith. You know why I keep coming back to church? Because I need to be renewed. You want to know why I keep praying? Because I need to be renewed. You want to know why I keep reading the Word of God? Because I need to be renewed. You know why I keep getting up and fighting? Because that's the call of God of every Christian warrior. It's a fight. Every single day, it is a fight. And that is the way God planned it until we take our last breath or the trumpet sounds. had a man here recently who said, I, I literally do not know what to do. He said, I am fighting every single day spirits. And he said, every day I, I see them, okay? I see them. So either, either he could be suffering from hallucinations or he could be suffering from intense spiritual warfare. But am, am I to judge either one? No, I'm not. But he said, I see spirits, and I'm fighting every day, and I pray. He said, and I know that I'm delivered, but they keep coming back, and they keep fighting. He says, and I just I want them to go away forever. And I said, sir, you are a warrior of Christ. And as a warrior of Christ, you are called upon every single day to put on the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Hold the sword of the Spirit. Hold the shield of faith. Gird yourself with truth. Cover your feet with peace. He said, and you don't stop fighting. You don't stop fighting. Every day we are called to assemble ourselves. Every day we are called to put on the whole armor of God. Resilience is within you. Paul said in Philippians 4.13, he says, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. You see, Paul decided a long time ago in one of those traumas that, I, that, I, that we learned about, he decided at one point, he says, I am done depending on my own strength. What strength I have, I will kneel in prayer and I will surrender to the king of all kings. And he says, that is the way I'm going to make it. And for those of you that maybe have forgotten your New Testament Bible history, Philippians is a letter that is written from a cold, nasty, dark prison cell where Paul was at. 
And even while he was in prison, awaiting execution, he wrote the words, I can do everything through Christ. Everything. Everything. Doesn't matter what I face. I can stand before those that are going to kill me through Christ who gives me strength. Resilience. Resilience. Paul was physically imprisoned, but not mentally conquered. Not mentally conquered. The next slide. Resilience is accomplished through five choices that you and I have to make every single day. We can choose strength over weakness. We can choose discipline over disorganization. We can choose solitude over isolation. We can choose humility over pride. And we can choose goals over chaos. Resiliency and strength. Strength is a choice in our actions. It requires a decision and a steadfast commitment to build upon it. And you know what? We need to accept right now that life as we know it is tough. Jesus promised it. He said in John 16, Jesus said, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. The Apostle Paul realized the trials will never stop. But where do I find my strength? In Jesus Christ, the one who has overcome the world. Praise God. If we know life is tough, then let's prepare for it. Let's prepare for it with strength. Some people refuse to move forward or take action because they are constantly choosing weakness. And I know that's hard to digest because we, don't, we need to realize that strength is not referring to our physical strength, not how much weight you can lift, not how much you can push or pull, but strength is right up here. It is right up here in the cognitive abilities that you have to process life and all the trauma that you face. Paul wrote one of my absolute favorite scriptures. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. In the NLT it says, so I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. Every step that we take mentally should be filled with purpose and strength. Each one of us only has so much strength to use throughout the day. We do. You only have so much bandwidth. You only have so much mental capacity. So much. In Paul's statement, there's a powerful truth right here. Next slide. That truth is, do not waste your strength on matters in life that you cannot change. Paul says, every step I take, I run with purpose. So that means all of the emotional energy that I have, all of the mental energy that I have, all the spiritual energy I have, I must focus on what I can change. And I cannot focus on what I cannot change. Shadow boxing, just beating the air, just beating the air, it's a waste. What good does it do? Every punch, every punch that you take needs to have a target. Every punch, every prayer that you pray needs to have a target. Every mental capacity, every spiritual, every emotional needs to have a target. Sometimes we need to take a deep breath and ask ourselves, what am I wasting my strength on? Resilience in your discipline. Discipline controls your strength. It gives it purpose for good. Discipline, it's all about self-control of the body, the mind, the words, and the emotions aimed toward improving your life. It is an attitude of constant improvement and intolerance for just existing. 
It's an attitude of constant improvement and intolerance for just existing. You know what I despise so much about social media? And I know some of you have it, so don't act like you're all innocent. Don't waste your time on online arguments. Don't waste your time on online arguments. It is an absolute waste of your mental, spiritual, and emotional strength. <laughs> Make a pledge to yourself in 2024. I will not waste my emotional, mental, and spiritual energy on online arguments. It is a waste of your brain cells. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Discipline. It's not a spectator sport. It requires you to take action. No matter how much talent people have, the prize goes to the one who stays on task until it is completed. Does not matter how smart you are. Doesn't matter how right you think you are. But the prize goes to the one who stays the course, who keeps their eyes on Jesus, who keeps marching forward, who has a purpose, who has a destination, who has resilience and a determination. Mm. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sister. 1 Corinthians 9.27 he says, I discipline in my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. We're not talking about athletic, physical. We're talking about right up here in the heart and the mind. I discipline my mind. I discipline it just like an athlete that's training. Otherwise, I fear that the next trauma that I experience, I will lose everything. Your faith needs to be the most important thing that you focus on in 2024. Your walk with God has to be the most important thing that you focus on in 2024. Why? Because you're going to experience a trauma this year. It may be small or it may be big. But we will experience trouble. It's life. Being disciplined means you do not demand a soft and protected life. You don't give responsibility of control of your life to others. Discipline says it is my responsibility, and with God's grace and help, I'm determined to move forward. I'm determined today to put one step in front of the other. Resilience in your solitude. Solitude is intentional. It's self-control quiet where you process your thoughts and your feelings and your actions with depth and honesty. You know what? I'm all for prayer. I'm all for intense prayer. I'm all for prayer where you lift your voice and you shout to God and you dance to victory or you're crying and you're, you're travailing before God. But I'm also for the type of prayer where you sit in solitude and you take a deep breath and you quietly say, God, this is what I'm feeling right now. And I just want to talk to you. I just want to whisper to you. God, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. God, I'm experiencing anger. I'm experiencing depression right now. God, I need your help. In the quiet solitude, you let the tears flow. In the quiet solitude, you allow your heart to calm down and stop the racing. In the quiet solitude, you allow your mind to stop racing, and you're just there in the presence of a holy God, and you feel him just wrap his arm around you and comfort you in the moment. That is solitude, folks. It's healthy. It's needed. Solitude is not isolation. Isolation is where you're hiding. You're trying not to think. You're distracting yourself from dealing with the real issues in life. That is isolation. One of the symptoms of PTSD is isolation, which leads you down a road of incompleteness, depression, and anxiety. But solitude, 
Solitude, it's different. Solitude is you set aside all distractions in life, you turn off all the media, you get off Facebook, you get off Instagram, you get off Twitter, you get off YouTube, and you're there in the presence of the King of all kings. And you begin to feel your emotions. I love the book of Psalms, Psalms 46 and 10. It says, be still and know that I am God. Running yourself ragged is not necessarily going to lead you to recovery. Running yourself ragged is not necessarily resilience. But be still and know him. Be still and know him. Resilience in your humility. The attitude of humility involves honesty, a drive to learn, respect, willingness to sacrifice, and gratitude. It's the opposite of being an arrogant person. Arrogance is boastful, blames others, can't learn from their own mistakes, takes credit for unearned success. Dishonesty wallows in self-pity over failures, undermines the success of others. But it takes a lot of humility for you and I to really be honest with ourselves and with God. It takes a lot of humility in your resilience. Resilience, humility go hand in hand. You got to have humility, you got to have honesty if you're ever going to recover from the past. When we look at Job, we see that Job, you know, he handled some pretty devastating things in life. He handled trauma like no one in this room has ever experienced before. And, and oftentimes we praise Job. We're like, man, no one's like Job. But if you really read through the book of Job, you'll see that he handled trauma pretty well. But there are times when he absolutely failed in the way he handled trauma. I believe that Job wavered between being humble and being extremely arrogant at times. So much so that God told him in the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 3, he says, brace yourself like a man, Job, because I have some questions for you, and you're going to answer them. And then you read further on, go to verse 34. These are some of the questions that God asked Job. He says, Job, can you shout to the clouds and make it rain? Can you make lightning appear and cause it to strike as you direct? Hey, Job, who gives you intuition to the heart and instinct to the mind? Job, who is wise enough to count all the clouds and who can tilt the water jars of heaven? Job, when they're parched and the ground is dry... And the soul has hardened into clods? Job, you question me why you have gone through this trauma. You question me why you're experiencing devastation like, we, like you've never experienced before in the history of man. But guess what, Job? I'm in charge. I'm God. I am the creator. I'm the one that orchestrates everything. God was giving Job a grand-scale lesson on humility. And yes, it is so tempting and it's so human-like to question God. Why am I experiencing all of this? We rarely understand the struggles of the present. Rarely. But if we approach with humility we will be better equipped to understand when our troubles are all in the past. And God designed the church this way so that we can be a strength to our brothers and sisters. Resiliency in your goals. Last one, last point this morning. We're always moving. We're either moving forward or we're moving backwards. We are always moving. And I'm not talking about physical steps, but right up here, you and I are always moving. We're either regressing or we are progressing. Next slide. 
When we think of goals, excuse me, go back. <laughs> when we think of goals, we think of goals determine where you want to go. Plans keep you on track with well-defined and achievable steps towards your goals. And then strategies are the flexible, adaptable actions you take to achieve your plans and making changes as needed. So you have goals, you have plans, and you have strategies. And that is the recipe for living a life of resiliency. What's the alternative plan to this? Many of us have adopted the alternative plan. And that plan is called, we will see what happens plan. How many of you have really got far in life by the we will see what happens plan? <laughs> Not very many of us. But God gave you a brain and he expects you to use it. I know we said that to our teenagers, but even as adults, we need to rem be reminded God gave us a brain. He expects us to use it. Trauma victims who do not set goals to get healthy and free. What is the outcome for them? They continue to live a life of mental suffering and bondage to their trauma. Instead of the trauma being a life event, the trauma becomes a master of their life. We cannot let that happen to us. God has given us the power and the strength to overcome. Is it going to be without mistakes? Probably not, because we're human. But he has given us what we need to engage in goal-oriented planning that is life-changing. At the end of Paul's life, while sitting in prison, Paul never gave up on his goals. In Philippians 3, verse 12, he says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. He's sitting in prison. He recognizes his life. He is reflecting on all the trauma that he's faced in life, all the successes he's faced in life, the people that he's preached to, the churches that he's started, his missionary journeys, and he's saying, I don't say that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus possessed me. He's pressing on in prison. Where are you pressing on to, Paul? You're not moving. You're chained to a wall. No, he's pressing on right up here. He says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race, receiving the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Again, it's not a race on foot, but it's a race in the Spirit. What was Paul referring to when he said, I haven't already achieved these things or reached perfection? Next slide. He says, in the previous verses, Paul talks about, in, in these previous verses in Philippians chapter 3, he talks about becoming righteous through faith in Christ, being made right with God, wanting to know Christ, wanting to experience God's mighty power, suffering with Christ, sharing in his death, experiencing the resurrection from the dead. In the preceding verses, that's what he talks about when he talks about, I haven't reached perfection yet, but I keep pressing forward. What is Paul pressing forward on? He's pressing on each and every one of those goals. What a list of goals. What a list of goals. He says, I haven't achieved them, but I keep focusing on them. I keep pressing forward. Let's all stand to our feet this morning. By the time Paul wrote Philippians, he had to be well up into age, well up into age, exhausted, tired, hurt in every joint of his body, in pain every single day, 
from the beatings, the lashings, all that he faced, all the trauma. But Paul said, I'm going to press forward. I'm never, ever stopping in my faith, in my emotions, and in my mind. Paul's trauma was simply an opportunity to suffer with Christ and to know the power of his resurrection. That, my brothers and sisters, that is resilience. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness and mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your spirit this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the word of God that changes us, that transforms us. Thank you, Lord, for the hope and the inspiration that you give us today. Thank you, Lord, for the mental and spiritual strength that you have given us this morning to be in the house of the Lord. God, I'm asking that you would help us to overcome the trials and the traumas that we have faced of our past. Help us to remember, Lord, it's just one more opportunity to be able to suffer with you and to experience the power of your resurrection. Always looking forward, always pressing forward, oh God. Help us to remember the prize that is set before us, and that is to be in your presence for all of us eternity. In the lovely name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning's lesson comes from a book called The Cure for Christ by Tim Murphy. If you're interested, I'll send you a link to it. God bless. Love each and every one of you. Look forward to seeing you back here tonight at six o'clock for communion service.